so, um, obviously, insofar as Britain has been experiencing any kind of recovery, it's pretty much been all concentrated in London, and this is particularly, um, particularly at the moment, it's, it's brought the divergence between London and the rest of the country, the clash of interests, as far as into quite sharp relief. So that's the kind of thing I think we're going to be discussing this session. Um, we are very lucky to have two people from the New Economics Foundation. We have James Meadway. Um, and we have uh, Faiza Shaheen, who's coordinating the NEF's work on inequality. Um, Faiza is going to speak first, then James, and then we will have some discussion. So let's get started. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess it's helpful to start just by saying um, I've been working on this issue for a while now. And interestingly, when I, when I did my PhD, when I started my PhD course 10 years ago, um, people weren't really talking about economic inequality at all. In fact, people used to say to me, why, why are you looking at this? It's not important. Oh, do I need to speak louder or the mic work? Ah, no, it's oh. Okay, does that work? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, people thought that people working on economic inequality were crazy. There wasn't much funding for it. There wasn't a lot of interest in it. It was basically, we just need growth. If we have growth, these other problems will go away. You know, you don't, you don't need to look at this. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've been very slow to wake up and understand what economic inequality is doing, how high it is, the drivers of it, its impacts. Because there's been a basic malaise in the kind of academic sphere of work on this area, and it's only recently started to catch up with the problem which started back in the 80s, really. Um, so I want to start with a few facts today, some things you've probably already had, just to kind of give you the context of the, the levels of economic inequality. Um, I'm not really going to speak too much about the regional inequality stuff, and um, James is going to pick up on that. Um, and then I want to talk about what's driving inequality, because I think that's really where we need to think about. It's really important to know what those drivers are if we're to think about policy prescription, if we're to, to think about resistance and who we're fighting, what we're fighting here. So in terms of the headline statistics, of course, um, Back in the 70s, I find this quite hard to believe actually, 1979, we were as equal, well, one of the most equal high income countries, so as equal as countries like the Netherlands. And um, since then, we've become one of the most unequal high income countries. Um, and we saw this massive rise in inequality during the 80s, uh, a rise similar to what happened in Russia after the Soviet Union fell. So, very quick um, and rapid rise in inequality during the 80s. Since then, it, it's risen, but at a slower rate, so it's stayed high and in most recent years kind of relatively stable if you take one measure, the Gini coefficient measure. Now, if you look at the 1% versus the 99% measures, then it becomes much starker. You see this very high concentration of wealth at the top and the share of income going to the top 1% has risen from 10% in 1990 up to 15, around 15% now. Um, we see wealth concentration uh, much higher, so there were some recent stats out to show that the 1% now have more wealth than the bottom 50% put together. So re really very stark uh, um, numbers there. And I think one of the things to note is that uh, there's a difference between how much our inequality our economy generates and how much inequality we kind of see, how much disposable income people have in their pockets. So um, Policy, so the welfare net redistribution does a lot to make a very unequal situation a little bit less unequal. Um, and the OECD is now saying that we're going to see inequality rise because of austerity, because of cuts, because the welfare system is not there in the same strength anymore to um, mitigate against this inequality. So we're going to have higher levels of economic inequality. Quite scary stuff. So... As I said, there's been a bit of a kind of dark of information in this area. We haven't really understood what's driving it. And actually, there's been a few, a few things that have been commonly said. So one of the things that we hear a lot is that it's, it's globalization. Um, and, and simply that um, is this the competition between unskilled labor in China versus here means that we have to pay people less, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, they're, they're kind of like throwing your hands up in the air. There's nothing we can do about it. It's globalization. Everyone's suffering from it. And, and that doesn't really hold up. It doesn't hold up for two reasons. One is when you look at where low paid sectors really are right now, they're not in sectors where we're trading. They are in social care, retail, hospitality. We're not, you know, we're not shipping off all our old people to China. We're not competing with other countries in the same way. So that argument doesn't really stand up um, in the way that, that kind of neoliberals would, would like to think it does. Um, 
And also uh, that other countries, so we've, you know, globalization, it should affect all countries. Other high income countries have been able to resist it much more. They haven't seen the rise of inequality that we have. So there's obviously things we can do against it. It's not, um, it's not inevitable. The other thing that's said quite commonly is it's about skills by its growth. So technology, so the fact that um, there's higher returns if you've got more income, if you've got more qualifications. Um, and you know it's just more difficult for everyone else. And the answer to that being, the solution to that being, we just educate everyone, and everyone will be able to do better in this economy. And that doesn't really work. Again, partly because, like I said, actually a lot of the the low wage work is in sectors where it's not clear that there will be higher wages if you've got higher skills. Um, and also, I think, I mean, I do think technology is important in understanding, and it's important because. And the returns to technology have been very uneven. So you can imagine um, mechanization, so the way that jobs in the middle are disappearing because um, technology can effectively do those jobs. And I heard someone recently talk about the question that we all need to be asking ourselves now and into the future is, do my skills, um, can my skills be replaced by technology or um, can they complement technology? So there, there is something there in technology, but in and its own, it doesn't really, make us understand or really explain why we've seen levels of inequality rise in the way that we have. So I really want to kind of focus now on kind of three much more interesting areas, areas where I think there's probably um, making a kind of big difference on why we have high levels of um, inequality and high concentration. Um, and one of those is power, it's power and balance. Um, ultimately, when you look at the falling share of wages going to the bottom 90%, um, we can see that that's happened at the same time as trade unions have become less prominent and uh, collective bargaining coverage has fallen. And what that really is about ultimately is that people don't have, workers don't have the power to stand up for their rights in the way that they used to. So it's much easier on an individual basis for capital owners and employers and big companies to be able to drive down wages when workers don't really have a right or don't really have uh, the mechanism by which to stand up together and say, actually, this is not OK. And that is, that is something that has come out in official reports from IMF and OECD, so organisations that aren't really considered left wing, um, that, that trade unions are important, but then they kind of, when it comes to policy prescription, again, they go back to education. So that's quite interesting. So, so actually the evidence shows that it's power, the power imbalance, and yet the policy hasn't really caught up with that. Um, the other thing is rent seeking, and by this I mean, um, Basically, people that own a lot and make money off the back of that without investing anymore. And you can see that quite typically within housing. And this is a really important thing for somewhere like London and the UK. Um, people buying housing, not really having to invest any more in it, but because of the way that house prices are increasing, they're making more and more money off the back of it. Um, so that's kind of a rentier's economy. Um, and that happens with not just housing, but it happens with other types of assets as well. And it's the sort of thing that Piketty is getting at. So this idea that the returns to those things are growing much faster than um, economic growth. So people, capital owners, are going to do much better in the system. Um, and the other, the other side of that also is the way in which rent seeking, so this concentration of wealth at the top, is affecting policy influence. So who has influence over policy? So people being able to lobby government in the direction that they want them to go in. And this isn't some kind of conspiracy theory. We see this again and again. And we see it very strongly in the US. Um, I, I can't name names, but there was a Labour politician that said to me, oh, I don't think this is, this is important. I, we're not, you know, when we were in government, I never had dinner with a banker, etc. This is not important. And then next week, we saw in the news that um, Cameron was having dinner with business owners for cash. And, um, and, and you can see it, and you, can't, you have to see how this is having an influence on our policy. Um, the other thing is financialization. So, um, Having a very strong finance sector has been highly correlated with, high, with higher levels of economic inequality. And that's partly because bankers and uh, CEOs are able to set very high wages, wages that go beyond what would seem okay given their skill level. So they have this kind of extra premium. And that's partly, again, to do with power imbalances, partly to do with the way wages are set at the top. Effectively, people at the top set their own wages or set each other's wages. And when that happens, of course, you can imagine if you set your own wage, it would probably be much higher uh, than it needs to be. So that's what's going on. Those, those are the drivers. And then, but in truth, 
we don't really know quite yet about kind of the tentacles of inequality, how wide and deep they go in our economy, in our society, in our democracy. But what we do know is that they are playing an important role. And I just want to talk a little bit more about kind of how wealth is being accumulated, because I think this is becoming kind of more and more dominant part of the debate because of um, Thomas Piketty's, my French is awful, um, his book. Uh, and I think we need to really think about the way in which housing market, debt, things that we don't, the banking sector is really playing into inequality, and we don't often think about those areas. And, and once you start thinking about those areas, you realise that this isn't a matter of just changing education policy or some social policy or redistributing a little bit more. This is about fundamental structural change within the economy. So we can think about, for instance, uh, what's happening in the housing market and actually how we accumulate wealth. When you look at what's happening in the UK, most people are accumulating wealth. The greatest share of wealth that is being accumulated is through the housing sector. Now, that isn't just someone just buying one house and living in it. That's people buying quite a few houses um, and renting it or just making money off the back of it. Um, and that is having all kinds of impacts as well as kind of rising debt levels, rising house price levels. It's also not just reflecting levels of inequality, it's also then distorting levels of inequality further, increasing inequality further. So I know this is probably not the best answer to have given that uh, I'm meant to have a PhD in this stuff, but I think right now um, we, we've got a sense of something going on and there's a lot more for us to understand. Um, and that's really important then when we could talk about resistance, which I hope we can at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, and now I'd like to pass them to James. Thank you. Um, yeah, cheers. Thank you, Pfizer, for the, for the introduction there. I wanted to talk about, um, uh, I wanted to talk about the, the kind of regional dimensions of this and the geography of what's happening uh, with in inequality um, and the way in which this has an impact on the kind of society we live in and what we might do about it. Because what comes out of this, or what should come out of this, I hope, is a sense of what we as the left, broadly defined, <laughs> might want to do about any of these issues. Because you know, we can kind of, we actually do have, I think, a set of reasonably good analyses or reasonably good sets of ideas about what's wrong with the world. There's probably a got is then what do you do about it and how do you make it happen? You know, this is a continuum. Uh, dilemma for the left and has been for, for some time. So I wanted to talk about a particular issue that I think is becoming uh, more obvious and it is going to become much more obvious uh, over the next few years if we carry on sort of present uh, trends, which is this precisely this problem of a kind of regional inequality, which means in practice precisely the problem of London, you know, to put it quite crudely. It's the issue of the place we're all in and its relationship to the rest of the country and quite how unusual that is and why it's causing such a problem. I mean, if you look at the figures, Britain is the most geographically unequal country inside the EU. We have, it's quite good doing this in our current location, we have down the road, you know, 10 minutes walk, uh, if you walk fairly fast, uh, essentially the richest single place on the entire continent, in the city of London then spreading out into Westminster, the richest single area on the entire continent. And then at the same time, if you go outside of London, if you go to somewhere like Wirral or the Welsh Valleys, you find places there who, on a kind of output per person basis, a kind of measure of economic development, are comparable to Romania or Bulgaria or these new recent EU members. That, of course, always get parodied as, as you know, desperately poor and backward. Nigel Farage makes a big song and dance about this. David Cameron, uh, before Christmas, as a sop, of course, to the kind of Nigel Farage UKIP view of the world, was suggesting that perhaps if we expand the EU in future, we ought to set a kind of richness test. And basically, only if, you, only if you're actually quite rich are you going to be allowed access to all the wonderful benefits all the rest of us have. No, which is kind of nonsense and discriminatory and awful in lots of different ways, but you know, you could apply that inside of Britain. You know, he was suggesting that we won't give passports. If Ukraine wants to join, uh, perhaps he won't give a full passport. We won't let them move around the rest of the country. Look, if you can apply that to whole countries, you can apply it inside of Britain. You can say you're going to prevent people moving from the Welsh Valleys to anywhere else on the grounds that they're far too poor. The extent of geographical inequality regional inequality in Britain is absolutely cataclysmically large and it has been for a very very long period of time some of this is dealing with very very long centuries old process of development which London has always been really big you know essentially since I'm just thinking essentially since 
after Boudicca raised the place to the ground in like, you know, the early sort of early first century, that kind of thing, it has always had this kind of geographical advantage. It has always maintained a great deal of sort of economic weight around what it does. But then what's happened in recent years is that weight has started to transform into something over and above. That the extent of regional and geographical variation, which had started to close in the kind of post-war period, after the Second World War, it started to decline somewhat, has now completely uh, gone haywire and is completely divergent, at least uh, in its richer parts, from uh, the rest of the country. And I do want to stress, of course, this bit about the richer parts of London, because lurking underneath this is the problem of class. And lurking underneath this is exactly the problem of the 1%, or really the 0.1%. But the trouble is just saying it's the 0.1% is that they live in a particular place and the rest of us live in a particular place. So it has particular impacts on the kind of politics you get, on the kind of development that you get. Like if we're standing here, Tower Hamlets, which is where, uh, which is where we are, you know, the borough that we're in at the minute, is uh, the last time I looked was, what, the third most deprived um, borough in the country on some measures of deprivation, standard measure of deprivation. That's one part of it. It also has uh, Canary Wharf and some of the very richest people in the country living here. But you can walk you know, 10, 15 minutes in that direction and find some very deprived, very overcrowded uh, housing estates. And just whilst we're on this, uh, I may as well throw in how pleased I was to see Lutfi Rahman re-elected as mayor of Tower Hamlets after a disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful, racist campaign against him. This is, of course, a mayor and uh, a local authority that has built more council houses than any other uh, in the country over the last few years. So very good that they were doing that, very good that it's starting to resolve some of the issues here. But nonetheless, the structural inequalities that you're looking at, it's incredible mangling of rich against poor that you see jammed inside of London is of course also part of the story. But the bit I wanted to focus on in particular was how we got here and what we might do about it and, uh, and the way in which the relationship between London and the kind of politics that ends up centred on London plays itself out in the rest of the country. Because I think what you had with, with, with New Labour, and I remember, I was kind of working in the government at the time, I suppose, that what you had under New Labour was a sort of optimistic belief that if you let the City of London, financial services, do its thing, you could kind of generate wealth, as they thought was happening in the City of London, and then sort of spread its benefits around somewhat. And some of that will come directly through public spending. So you, you do actually increase uh, spending somewhat on the NHS, on health, on education, on a few bits and pieces over there. And some of it takes a, a rather stranger sort of ideological form that you say to de-industrialise parts of the country, places like where I'm from, like Wigan, or go to the North East, uh, places that used to have, and this is an important part of the story, used to have very large manufacturing industries and now, frankly, do not. You're looking at a good four million manufacturing jobs lost over the last uh, 20, 25 years or so. This hollowing out of labour markets, hollowing out of whole areas of the country. And as a strategy for promoting development, for trying to remove some of the more appalling consequences, what Thatcher and then Major did to the country and did to these places, your strategy for removing them was basically what you'd call kind of neoliberal with a, with a human face, right? So it was like, yes, of course, we're going to have this free labour market. Yes, of course, uh, we're going to, you know, we're not going to, you know, ideally, we don't have trade unions at all, but hey, they're not going to do very much. We're going to remove some protections. This is our lovely, flexible labour market. It's a lovely free market that we all live in, but it's going to be okay for you because we're going to give you skills, so then you'll get a, a job. And at the same time, we've got a particular model of regional development that will centre on, and a, and he is a kind of culprit in this, what Richard Florido is the guru of this sort of thing called the creative class. So in the middle of these deindustrialized, hollowed out cities, if you want to promote growth, what you need moving in is a whole load of bluntly hipsters. And what you need moving in is a whole load of nice cafes and uh, maybe an art gallery and, you know, places people would sit and like play in their, um, you know, you wouldn't have an iPad at the time. What do people have in the 2000s? I suppose we just had <laughs> mobile phones, even like text each other or something. But you get the idea. So you move these people in and gradually this is what's going to promote life in cities and gradually this kind of turns into a sort of trickle down effect that impacts on, on everyone else. Now, I, I mean, I like the Rich Mix Centre, I have to say this, but I do actually like the Rich Mix Centre and it's very good that we can use it for this sort of thing. The Rich Mix Centre is kind of part of that strategy. You know, you build this big, I remember there's a huge fuss, I used to live around it, big fuss about it being built at the time, it was quite expensive. I mean, it's very nice, it's quite expensive. And it's like, why are we building this bloody great, you know, venue, oh God, you know, and it's like, so you build the thing and you sit it there, and then what happens around it? Well, you can see what's happened around it. You can see, if anybody does know 
what the East End of London was like even five years ago. You can see the transformation that's kind of happened here. You can see the way in which gentrification has happened. But, all right, you can sort of say it's success. You've done your Richard Florida thing. You've built your, you know, your anchor point, your, your place for all the kind of creative people to hang out, and then it's gradually turned into all of this <laughs> over here. That's, that's fine. This is a less convincing argument. I don't want to pick on places in particular, but I'll pick on one I know. It's a less convincing argument in Wigan, right? It's a less convincing <laughs> argument in Doncaster. It's a less convincing... You're, you're laughing, right? But it's, it's a kind of cruel joke to start to say that all you need to do is to get a happy face near liberalism. Where you move in a few people who are drinking like cappuccinos rather than tea, you know, and then this will transform an area and provoke development and all the rest of it. That's what the rhetoric plays itself out as. And it sort of looks like it works for a while. It sort of looks like it works in the 2000s. There's a kind of gloss that starts to appear in lots of inner cities. Manchester is the absolute pinnacle of this one. The transformation, aided of course by the IRA in blowing up the Arndale Centre in the early 90s, but the transformation of Manchester uh, city centre, which I remember back in the day has been a big drafty weird place, into like what looks like a very kind of high gloss, quite well off, quite well to do. There's a few trams. It all seems very European. There's a few kind of trams rumbling around. It's all quite quite pleasant in the city centre, looks like a success story. A new Labour, of course, talking up to the skies. It's one of their flagship uh, councils. But what's underlying this, and the real driver of all of this, isn't the creative class, isn't some wonderful vision of capitalism where it's all based on creativity and all this sort of thing. No, the actual vision of capitalism we've got is it's all based on debt. And it's all based on debt generated in particular by the financial institutions that we have over here, and the ability of that debt to then drive up house prices. And if you drive up house prices, you can generate a kind of sense of prosperity almost anywhere. It's based on rising property values, of which the appearance in some places of a creative class of you know, these wonderful you know, free-thinking entrepreneurs and all the rest of it is a kind of side effect. The real mechanism here is something deeply embedded into British capitalism, which is the only thing, I feel I've done this joke already, but it's the only thing it's really good at making is debt. They can't really produce uh, very much else. And everything else is a bit of a froth on top of that. So this works through most of the 2000s. You're chugging along, no return to boom and bust, says Gordon Brown. It's all going quite nicely. And then comes grinding to halt around about 2007, 2008. Um, people will remember Northern Rock, you know, hailed as a success story. Northern Rock, uh, unusually, uh, a, a financial institution that, that kind of convinced itself it was a major financial institution, which is part of the problem, uh, based in the Northeast. Um, realises in November 2007 that there was kind of no money left. I mean, this is, a bit, this is not even accurate, really, because banks don't really have money in their vaults at all. That's kind of the problem with the bloody thing. But they realise they're not going to be able to lend money out to people in the rate and scale they would have been able to. The people who are lending them money aren't lending them money anymore. So there's panic, because it looks like Northern Rock won't be able to. If you've got savings there, you won't be able to get your savings back. So the run on the bank, first one for 125 years. Forget the name of the Victorian institution that, that collapsed in like, you know, what, the 1880s or thereabouts. Uh, run on the bank, queues outside Northern Rock. This northern east, northeastern institution disappears, and that is a harbinger of the general collapse that happens right the way through to the 15th of September 2008, which is, of course, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, uh, US's third largest investment bank at the time, just disappears overnight. The cue for that is absolute financial cataclysm. The response of that is the bailouts. And this, I think, is the particular point about why all of this matters for politics. Because there's a very, very particular thing that's taking place here, I think. Is that during the boom years, yes, other parts of the country did sort of all right. There was employment. There were jobs being created. Now, if you look a bit closer at the figures, you realise a lot of those jobs are kind of publicly sector funded. British private capitalism is quite bad at delivering jobs in general, at least until fairly recently. But nonetheless, there's a bit of prosperity. In London, and for particular bits of London, and for particularly people in London, there is a huge amount of prosperity. They are doing very well indeed. That the operations of the particular kind of very financialized capitalism, capitalism that's led by a financial sector, these leading elements are in finance, that there's a particular geographical concentration of these operations, and it is literally just over there, and that concentration of geographical operations means, in turn, there's a concentration of the profits to be made from those operations. So there's a real concentration of wealth that's emerging in London and associated with particular people in London, people who are working in financial services. So there's a concentration, a metropolitanisation, you might say, and Carol Williams at the University of Manchester coining this, a metropolitanisation of profits 
profits are all in London. The crash happens, and who pays for it? Well, who pays for it, of course, is everyone else. Right? So there's a regionalization of losses. And that's the meaning of austerity. That you have this very geographically focused form of development, which is London-centered growth with a kind of backwash. That when it collapses, the majority of the profits are basically concentrated in London and on particular people in London. And then when it crashes, everybody else in the rest of the country carries the cap. It's a power imbalance, the kind that Pfizer was talking about. And it's a power imbalance, I think, because you have a very close set of relationships between uh, the city of London and major institutions of the British state. And then that turns into a particular form of politics we have in which bailouts, which by the way, on the IMF estimate, and you know, the IMF is not a cabal of Trotskyists, the IMF estimate, so therefore a conservative estimate, says uh, costs us about 1.3 trillion pounds or 100% of everything produced in the entire country for a year to bail out the financial system. Catastrophic cost from which we're now expected to, to pay austerity. But a concentration of power and of relationships of power that force this unequal settlement on the rest of the country. And you can see at the level of individual personnel, I, I feel I probably shouldn't name people, but like my old boss at the Treasury uh, was appointed <laughs> after the crash to run or to help run UK Financial Investments, which was the new body set up to look after the bits of the banking system that we had to nationalise. Bits of the banking system we had to nationalise, RBS, Lloyds, that sort of thing, um, and run them alongside the bankers who used to run these bloody places uh, on a kind of basically commercial basis. You know, there was no sense at any point you might turn these institutions, which the public now own, into publicly accountable institutions. No, 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 they're expected to make a profit. The fact they never do make a profit, look at RBS, is neither here nor there. You're going to run it as if you can. So he's appointed to this, straight from the Treasury into this. He then leaves that, goes off to one of the big, I won't name it, one of the big private banks and has a very nice job there. Most, last time I caught up with him at all was he'd gone straight back to a very senior position right back in the Treasury again. So it's backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards on the level of senior personnel. This happens all the time. Apparently the word in French is pantouflage, which comes from the word for slippers, because it's quite a comfortable existence. You kind of walk around between these jobs. It's all very nice. This is a fusion and a concentration of power that has a geographical dimension. And the result of that is the rest of the country loses out particularly. You can see it in the, in the figures and in the impact of austerity. The extraordinary thing about austerity, particularly at the level of local councils, is that it is the poorest places that have lost out the most from the cuts. They're being hit doubly hard. They had to have some level of public expenditure to, to compensate for the fact that they were poor. Therefore, if you cut public spending, they are hit hardest. But that means, on the flip side, the richest places are actually seeing revenues increase over this period of time. If you go to local authorities surrounding London, you'll find that they're better off under austerity than they would have been uh, a few years ago. They have more money coming in. So this complete sort of anti-redistribution, that you have government actions reinforcing inequality rather than reducing inequality is a net outcome of all of this. Now, how does this uh, play out? And I think I'm being told to, to wind up at that point. I think there's a couple of things here that without some sense of the peculiarities of geography, like in this country, and the very, very unusual, this is a very, very weird place, it's weird, it's an exception inside the rest of Europe because of the levels of inequality in particular, and because of the way people respond to that inequality, unless we start to get a sense of how unusual this is and how we might deal with it, I think we'll just end up going round and round in little circles. One manifestation of that inequality, of that kind of geographical unevenness, of course, is the demand for Scottish independence. This is exactly a demand about who controls a country. Where does power lie? If you're in Scotland, it is almost certainly better for you to have power lying somewhat closer to home and out of the grip, frankly, of the city of London, so somewhere like Edinburgh, than it is to try and have your country run from uh, Westminster. Almost certainly the case. And I'm absolutely in favour of a vote for Scottish independence. The issue of Welsh independence and further autonomy for Wales is a similar, is a similar issue that you start to see coming through. I believe there's a march planned for later in the year, precisely on the issue of Welsh independence. It is again that need to break up this geographical concentration of power. And where that leads us, I think, for those of us in England, is that we have to have an understanding that it's no good just offering a kind of abstract denunciation of capitalism. 
capitalism is bad, let's do something about it. We have to have a sense of what does that mean on the ground? How does the geography of capitalism play itself out? And at least part of the demand, and I suspect certainly if Scottish independence goes ahead, at least part of that demand is for a transfer of authority and power back to the regions, back to local authorities. We live in an incredibly politically centralised system. It is very, very hard for any local authority to do very much. You do find councillors who say they want to oppose the cuts, but what can they do? They try and oppose the cuts, government just turns up and runs your council for you. That the demand for a transfer of power and authority, a meaningful transfer of power and authority, outside of this concentration in Westminster and the city, is itself a powerful demand for change and for transformation that opens the route up to a different way uh, of running society. So I suspect one of the things we need to do in the midst of all this is to start to raise some what would have been otherwise quite long-standing demands that are left for devolution, for a transfer of authority, to break up the concentration of power that we have down the road here and start to say that an important part of what we're doing is transferring power back to people, back to local areas, and that is how you start to drive a blow against the appalling financialized capitalism that we actually live under. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now um, we've got time for questions and contributions. So um, as always, please um, keep it concise. Um, and yeah, uh, go on. Yeah. Um, Yeah, you too often. Right, thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for your contributions, except yours, Ruth. Um, so, yes, just want to pick up look, the local authority effect. Uh, I, I knew when I said it, somebody would pick up on this and, like, oh, God, then how does that work? Um, so, so, basically, the majority of local authority funding actually comes uh, from, I can't remember who asked this, there's incredibly bright lights, it's impossible to see any of you, really. Um, the majority of local authority co funding comes from central government. I mean, this is another instance. Again, like if you take the rest of Europe, around about half, on average, of what a local authority has is uh, from central government. The rest is from local sources. So they have more control over how they spend and what they do. Here, it's about 80% comes from central government, which means central government basically tells local authorities what to do. So if central government says, we're going to massively cut, and the really big impact of austerity so far, so far has been through uh, Department for Community and Local Governments. It's been huge, huge cuts, 20, 25% cuts in its funding over the last few years. So local authorities have been absolutely hammered. So if they get a reduction in their budget uh, from the central government and they have very high needs locally, this has a huge impact because they have to spend a lot. You know, if it's a relatively impoverished place, they expect to get a lot from government. That takes a huge hit because they have to spend a lot. They therefore have to cut spending quite dramatically locally. If you have relatively low needs locally, uh, you already are not asking for that much from central government, so you just get a kind of automatic increase. And what appears to have happened is that the automatic increase has been going to basically what are actually quite wealthy parts of the country. So they're already getting an increase in their budget, whilst great swathes of the places that need the money the most, precisely because they're poor, are the ones that are being hit hardest. So there's a very deep inequality that, that's structured that way. And of course you can see the political impact, because the places that are doing all right, uh, lo and behold, well, guess who they vote for? You know, put it that way. It, it's, you can see how the thing plays out uh, rather unpleasantly there. So the, what was the other, there was another question, I'll touch on this and then bring it back around to, to, to the sort of regional thing more generally, because the politics of it is, is the essential part, I suppose. I think it's absolutely right that the strength of the pound is, has itself got this, it has a general effect on certainly anybody trying to sell goods to the rest of the world. If the pound is expensive, it means your goods sold to the rest of the world are also expensive, which means other things being equal, people don't buy them. You know, they're less inclined to buy them. It's hard to sell something expensive if you can buy something cheap somewhere else. So you export less. But you need a high value pound, fundamentally, because if the pound is high in value, an investment in, for example, London property uh, looks really quite decent. You're, in, you're working in dollars, you transfer into pounds, you buy a London property, the value of the pound stays high, your investment is worth a small fortune. You need, in other words, a high value pound to keep the City of London on its feet, to keep uh, the City of London as this kind of world centre for financial dealings. So what the effect on the rest of the country is that you have a monetary policy set by this notionally independent Bank of England. Yes. 
It's independent of government. It's not independent of the banks. Uh, don't think, by the way, I mean, look, a central bank isn't there to look after the economy. It's there in the first instance to look after banks. That's what it does. So, you know, what banks want and what they uh, need to keep themselves happy, uh, it will look after in the first instance. The rest of the economy is a kind of sideshow uh, at that point. That's how a central bank operates. So if your policy is determined to try and keep the value of the pound high, it means that the rest of the country where there is more manufacturing industry suffers as a result. This is another instance of the political bias and how the thing plays out. And the result of that, over the last 20 or 30 years or so, is a very, very sharp mechanism for the increase of inequality more generally. Because the loss of manufacturing means that other things being equal means the loss of basically kind of mid-range, relatively well-paid, relatively secure jobs, and the replacement by, on one end of the scale, a few exceptionally well-paid, as Pfizer said, overpaid, massively overpaid jobs in finance, and everybody else on zero-hour contracts serving them coffee. That's the kind of economy that you end up looking at because of this determination to put finance at the centre of everything. Now, how does that play out politically? I'll finish and I'll just rattle from this a little bit because it's the issue with UKIP. That is London more like, uh, say, Manchester or Newcastle or whatever than the rest of the country? Yes, I think that's right, that you have a big city effect and it has an obvious effect on the kind of politics you get. The swing to UKIP was simply not so pronounced. I mean, it's been exaggerated in some ways. The swing to the far right has been somewhat overstated across the whole of Europe. If you look at Greece or Spain or Italy, there is not a swing to the right in anything like the same way. It's a big swing to the left. Um, so you, know, you don't want to overstate it. But nonetheless, the swing to UKIP is not as dramatic inside larger, larger cities. And some of it, I think, relates directly to prosperity and opportunities, and uh, aside from sort of bigger questions about identity and race and the rest of it, but I think some of it relates directly to prosperity and opportunities. Since 2010, 80% of jobs created in this country, in the private sector, have been created in London. Of the remaining 20%, around about sort of 18% of that goes to the other big cities, right? So that starts to tell you how people perceive their own opportunities, how they feel about the world, where they see uh, you know, their future life. If you can get a job, you're gonna feel a bit happier. Even if it's a crap job, you're likely to feel a bit happier about things. Frankly, for the rest of the country, which has not experienced this, and it is the smaller towns and the more isolated places. I mean, I lived in Essex for a while, so and God help us Farage claiming to be an honorary Essex man as he was after uh, the local um, election results there. But it is the isolated places, the places that lose out doubly, because they're certainly not part of London, but they're not even a big city that might have something else going on anyway. They lose out doubly, and it's that sense of desperation and isolation that starts to drive, I think, a kind of UKIP vote. And it's a very, very hard thing to crack. But there is still a distinction in that, in that the concentration of power remains inside of London, and it remains concentrated there, and that means there's an automatic bias towards what London does. And when I say London, of course, I don't mean the whole of London, I mean the city of London, and that one reason or one means to redress that is to start to say, outside of London, across the rest of the country, that this settlement is not working for whole swathes of uh, England and Scotland and Wales, of course whole swathes of England, Scotland and Wales, and that you can start to get together a local campaign, for instance, around the People's Assembly in somewhere like Newcastle, saying that we are the people of Newcastle, we are suffering directly as a result of this, and this is how you start to, I think, build a campaign that redresses uh, some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess just on the issue to start with about it's bad everywhere, and I think um, the overall statistics are really uh, really highlight that that actually if you look from 90, 90%, 90% in real terms, 90% of earners didn't see a real terms increase. It was the one percent that saw their incomes double, and so you see that overall. Of course, more of that one percent live in London. So you know, effectively, some of that is just about where people live, but it's also about the sectors that are in London versus everywhere else, um, and actually. Actually, when you look at poverty in London, um, actually, it's almost a historic artifact. People didn't want to live here before. People did not want to live in London before. Right? And what's happening, and you see this in the geography of poverty, is that people are getting pushed out. That's what's happening. Um, and so it is a matter of rich Londoners versus everyone else, actually, and to some extent. Um, and, and that's partly because of the sectors and partly because where people live. Um, and, it's, and it's because we haven't invested in other areas. So other countries have a very different geography. You know, don't have just one city where government is, where you know, all the creative stuff is. Where, you know, where it, it's, it's a very unbalanced economy, and that's partly because of policy and the decisions that we've made. Um, 
And with the economy we have, it's inevitable, really, that we would have this kind of regional inequalities and general inequality. Um, and in a consumption-based society, of course, you need to have these high earners that then go in to buy coffees and what have you. And if you don't have that in places, then people are just doing it on debt. And that, and that was the problem with the whole kind of regeneration under new labor, is that they, that they, they didn't make up for the fact that there just aren't good jobs. That the economy that we have does not create good jobs across the country. And the only way to overcome that is is through public investment. It needs an initial public investment, whether that be green investment, some kind of regional investment banks, what that, you know, you can't get away from the fact that the type of economy we have will not create jobs everywhere. We can't just leave it to the market. Um, in terms of this thing, I really get that thing about kind of Manchester, and I, I studied up in Manchester, my friends used to come up from London and do exactly the same thing, like, oh wow, there's shops here and it's nice. And, um, and there is very much this London vortex. Now, we already have very low levels of social mobility compared to other countries. You know, if you're born poor, you're likely to be stay poor. And they haven't yet looked at how that varies regionally. Like, I would love to do that study. I wanted to do that study, but they preferred to give it to someone that wanted to look at aspirations, which really bugs me, because actually that's about kind of blaming someone. You just don't have the aspirations. When really, this is a, this is a structural economy. You react to the opportunities that are around you and they and the people you know. And that London Vortex is really interesting, actually, because I heard someone present on the um, British Class Survey. I don't know, do people here, do you remember the BBC last year on the website, you could enter like whether you went to opera and they would, they would, they would, they would decide what class you were in. And, and there's this basically uh, at LSE that off the back of that, it was like thousands of people that were involved that did that survey, they're looking at the evidence. And what they found was that in London, I don't know about you, but I always think, oh, London, we always mix in, blah, blah, it's really great for that. But actually, you're much less likely to mix beyond your class in London. Actually, what's happening is that effectively what ha people are coming here and obviously the only people you meet are at work or friends of friends. You're in the same class. You don't actually know many people that are... We're not, we're not into mingling, mingling in terms of social economics in London. We're the worst for it compared to the rest of the UK. And that has real problems then when you have sympathy for others, where, how much you're willing to invest, etc. So this is really, this London vortex issue is really um, playing out. Um, on the housing thing, on the buy-to-let question, um, yeah, I think actually it's very easy to kind of hate the landlords or what have you, but this isn't about the small, you're right, it's not about the small scale so much, it's about the kind of, the, the big scale, it's about these, about, you know, people that, or companies that own very many houses, um, and, and it's also about those people that can buy that without the mortgage, without the debt. Um, those are the people that are really accumulating the wealth fast. Um, and, and that is about the kind of global 1% that are coming and buying properties in London. That is having a massive effect. Um, uh, on, and I just want to end, actually, I, I don't disagree with the point about devolution. I used to work for Centre Cities, and we used to talk about this quite a lot. The only problem there is when I went to cities like Manchester, who effectively did have a more, were very good at kind of wielding the power that they had, is that they had neoliberal values. They had very much, these places still thought in a kind of trickle-down economics way, get the creative class. If you looked at all their kind of economic strategy documents, it was all about get the creative class in, you know, make it this, the building shiny. Um, and that's, yeah, actually, if we're going to devolve, we need to make sure that that is not co-opted, that there are ideas there that don't just run in the same grain as they do in London. And, I think that's really important then to how we kind of organise at the local level and how we push push for change if there is some devolution, which I think Ed Miliband is offering to some to some extent. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to all of you. That brings us to an end, and I guess I'll see some of you in the session coming up soon. Cheers.